Welcome to another episode of the Bet the Process podcast, where Rufus and I try not to be too terrible and try not to get too shitty reviews on on uh, iTunes. But this yeah, we've gotten dark. What's that? You've gotten dark, Jeff. I've, I am. I'm in a I'm in a tough place. Um, someone rear-ended my car when it was parked on the street over the weekend. Um, literally just a hit and run and my car's totaled so in front of your house in front of my house yeah Yeah. they can't be going that fast on that street that's that's what i'm saying i mean clearly a drunken person probably i mean i guess i shouldn't make assumptions um anyways we're lucky enough to be joined by matthew corshain uh founder of data golf um and we're gonna talk a little golf and in uh, advance of the players championship and Hopefully you guys are listening to this before the player championship because Bruce is going to give out, I'm sure, a lot of negative EV uh, picks, picks that he maybe placed and then moved the market and then it's sort of useless. So I don't know why we end up doing that. But Matthew, welcome in and uh, would love to hear a little bit about data golf and sort of um, what data golf is, I guess, to, to start with. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks for having me on, guys. Um, yeah, so data golf started out just I guess summer 2016, uh, my background, so it's myself and my younger brother, Will, and I was doing a PhD in economics at the time. Will was working in the private sector. He also had an economics background. And yeah, we started out just a, a blog trying to break into the golf analytics space, which is a, well, it was a small space and it still is a small space. Um, and yeah, like a year after we started, I mean, the initial intention of the site had nothing to do with betting. Um, it was mostly just writing blogs. And at some point we started doing predictive stuff. Uh, and then we got into sort of live modeling. And then it was sort of a steady progression on the modeling side, side and the development side. And then maybe like 2019, Will and I started doing it full time. And uh, now we have a subscription product on the site and we are mostly geared towards betting and prediction. And um, But we, we do still try and offer a lot of stuff that's just useful for golf analytics analytics fan and so but to answer the original question is just the high level goal of the site is just we're trying to create the best possible possible website at the intersection of data golf and uh, betting yeah so do you guys have I, I often talk about this concept of um you know like this pyramid of uh analytics which starts at the bottom with data the second level is analytics and the third level is implementation on the bottom level of data i mean your name is uh, data golf or uh, what what is Great the name. <laughs> yeah how long did it take you to come up with that one but um w- what is what is, do you guys have proprietary data uh no so we well it's a developing situation so right now we uh everything on the site right now is based off just round level data which is just so round scores and then round level strokes gained so the pj tour publicly reports total strokes gained like off the tee approach around the green putting can we can we uh, take a step back sorry and, and talk about sure. the concept of strokes gain because i think that's a relatively new stat and i i don't actually fully understand how it's calculated so it would be great to, to sort of talk about that first yeah sure so so strokes gain was created by mark brody in like 2007 or something and it's based off so the pga tour does have at most of their events shot link data which is the system that gives detailed information on every shot hit including the gps coordinates and so what strokes gained is, is basically you can think Brody just developed uh, or estimated a function that says the average to, average PGA Tour player should be expected to take this many strokes from this location. And location is defined just by distance from the pin and the lie. So fairway rough and like native area or something. Um, and strokes gained is just on a shot. Don't forget just, Bush. Bush is the location too. I saw that right, last week. Yeah. It's just strokes gained is just the difference between your expected strokes to hole out at the start of the shot and at the end of the shot. So the easiest case is a putt where let's say you're putting from 10 feet. The average pro takes 1.5 putts to get down from there. So if you make the putt, then obviously your expected stroke to hole out is zero. So you went from a spot where it was 1.5 to zero and you only took one shot. So your strokes gain there is, is 0.5. And then you can apply that to any look. It's a beautiful and simple method, which is the best kind. Um, and yeah, that's, so does that make sense? Yeah, totally. So um, why, why do we believe, I guess, that that's when, when I think about these types of stats or these, these like why, why is it an improvement over just looking at 
because you put yourself into the situation, right? Like ultimately, you know what I mean? Like at at the start of every hole, everyone's, everyone's expectation is the same, right? Yeah. yeah. Like you're saying that there's some guys who are going to hit it in certain spots because they're bad golfers, like bad golfers hit it. Like, are you saying that there's selection on who hits shots from which? Yeah. I mean, like where, where does the, where does the stat actually create value? I guess is my question. Well, I mean, if you compare, well, you can go, you can, you were going to say something there, Rufus. I don't know. I mean, I, I was going to say it's an explanatory stat. I think it, it explains like where someone was good. Or, or so at least I that's what the, I guess it is intended to do. Like, Would you agree with that, Matt? That it's intended to say, okay, this, the value of this approach, this guy hit was X. Not yeah, like this sure. means it could be lucky. You know, there's balls that bounce off of the flag and go off the green and it looks like it was a really bad shot. And then there's like, Jordan Spieth holding out all the time, um, which looks like he's yeah. a great well, so, player. So I guess I guess the question is: Are certain types of strokes gained um, more predictive than others? I guess that's that's the key to this, right? Yeah. Well, to Rufus's point, predict, like the predictive the predictive value of the stat is a, is a separate question. Like it is just descriptive, and like the easiest yeah example is like hitting a shot to eight feet versus four feet is a big an approach shot is a big difference in strokes game but it's it's mostly luck realistically um but yeah there are i mean off the tee stuff is more predictive than approach around the green i mean to your original point why is it better than old stats i mean part of the reason though part of the reason strokes game is good is simply because it's relative to the field average if you took some of the old stats like greens and regulation putts per green and you just normalize them to be relative to the field on a given day, then they would be a lot better. And you could do that. But strokes gain is still adding, like it has flaws for sure, but it's adding a lot of value on the older stats, I think. I want to I want to ask you a question, Matt. If you had to choose between either getting the old stats, which are driving distance, driving accuracy, greens and regulation, scrambling, putts per round, putts per green and regulation. Let's say just those. And sand stays if you want. Um, or just getting the new stats. Strokes gained off the tee, approach, around the green, stress gain putting. Which would you, what, which one do you think would add the most value to you? I mean, right now we don't even use, we only use driving distance and driving accuracy of the, the old stats you were talking about. So we don't even use, and that's mostly out of like negligence, not really, it's not an active choice we made. I mean, I don't know. I, I think the stroke team stuff, it's probably more useful. I mean, I think the older stuff could be useful for course fit. Um, I mean, one thing is that in golf, it's honestly incredibly difficult to even improve upon a model that just uses, it may be not incredibly difficult, but it's hard to improve upon a model just using scores. When you're trying to incorporate the strokes gain data, because it's only at a subset of PGA Tour events, it makes it tricky. And um, yeah, I don't know. I, the GIR, GIR and stuff like that, I don't really know what you use that for if you have, I don't know, it provides different information than the strokes gain stuff, but. So, so I, like in, in general, the, like what we try to do is try to find areas where a golfer has, you know, underperformed their true ability or overperformed their true ability. So the question, I guess, is like you say, it's really difficult to, to beat um, a model with just based on score that there's, I mean, relatively speaking, obviously we can do better than that, but, but yeah, it yeah. gets you like almost all the way there. And so how much, I guess, like over the course of a season, how much are players benefiting or, um, or being hurt by, by luck, which is like, would you say? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is something I'm just sort of actively looking into. Like, I mean, I guess to Jeff's earlier question about the data, we are just now getting access to shot level data, like officially from the PGA Tour. Um, so we're sort of trying to start using that. It's a, I mean, it's a long process just for whatever reason. But um, I don't know, honestly, because that's the thing. Like if you... Sure, there's, there's a lot of stuff in golf that's not predictive, but if we know that we have to use a, a big sample of data to predict golfer performance, then all this luck should, in theory, roughly cancel out. I mean, that's not exactly true. And maybe, I mean, I've been starting to think lately that, yeah, we don't, our model's not short-term enough. And so if we could get rid of some of this luck, then you can, you can weight recent rounds more heavily when you get rid of the luck because there's more, there's more signal there. So that could be part of it too. Is a good example of that sort of maybe Jordan Spieth the last few rounds where, I mean, I I was watching a little bit on like Saturday, was it Saturday where he went really low and, and it's, you know, he 
hold out, he had a hole in one. Um, then he hold out from a bunker. Then he like had like a 35 foot putt. It was just like those types of things where, you know, obvious, like where those things are hard to repeat. Although Jordan Spieth has made a career of doing those things, it seems like, but um, are those the kind of things you're talking about where like maybe his round, you know, if you look at just his score, it looks like he played great, but overall he got really, and he did play well, but he got really fortunate in some areas. Yeah, like I think hole outs are the easiest example to look at where it's clearly if Spieth hits his tee shot to an inch versus in the hole, that's a difference of a full shot. His strokes gain is a shot higher because of that. And we can agree it's completely luck, um, at least on an approach shot. I do think with Spieth, the one thing is it's luck when a shot goes in from 30 yards. But if you if you like if you're good around the green, you scare the hole a bit more often and you're, there's more chances for you to get lucky. But um, but yeah, no, it's a good. We've actually started doing that where we subtract off a stroke for every hole out that a player made. So speed, we just had a minute mini players blog this week where we, we, we looked at like the biggest adjustment we're making to, to a player's skill level because of the hole outs that they've had recently is speed. It's still only like 0 0.08 strokes to his baseline skill, but uh, yeah, it's driven by he hold out twice at last week and a couple times at Pebble. Um, Does that include like bunker shots or like, so where, where's the, the spot where you're doing that? Because you have plenty of times where you have a shot that's yeah, from yeah. the fairway, just, right? It's defined as the fairway, but it's essentially a, a, a putt or something a guy's trying to hold out. Um, and, it's, and, and out of the bunker, I mean, a guy like Patrick Reed seems like, you know, every bunker shot is scaring the hole and versus like a Corey Connors where you're like, please just put it somewhere close to the hole and don't hit it in the water. Yeah, I agree. And that's why I think for Reed, he probably will going forward hole out more than Connors because he hits, well, he will because he hits more good shots. But yeah, no, we like we basically right now it's just arbitrary. We just say any shot over like 80 feet, we're going to just penalize the guy's stroke for making that, which actually could be a bit harsh. Maybe we should only be penalizing like 0.9 strokes or something. Cause like you said, it's not completely luck, but I think it's close to one stroke should be the penalty. And technically then you should be giving, well, it gets complicated and right it, when you think about how do you give credit for like a potential hole out for guys that hit it to two feet you know because there is a possible world where that could have pulled out right yeah well we probably don't want to get into this too much but <laughs> i think i think i think the key to predictiveness in in golf using the shot level data lies around the fact that things get super non-linear when you get near the hole like once you hit it if you hit it to 10 feet versus eight feet that's a big difference in strokes gain. If you hit it to 30 feet versus 32 feet, it's kind of, it's irrelevant, not irrelevant, but it's, you get these huge, these small differences in skill start mattering, or not, sorry, not difference in skill, small differences in where the shot ends up matter a lot when you're near the hole and they don't matter a lot when you're away from the hole. And I think there's something to be had there in terms of predictiveness. So what do you think then about the statistic, the proximity statistic? You know, you see that like average proximity to the hole. Do you think that's, because that, that basically says how, you know, how far are you away from the pin on each approach shot? Um, it's not something I use personally, but, but if, if we sort of assume that the difference between being, you know, zero feet from the hole and 10, well, essentially misses are linear rather than non-linear, then wouldn't someone with a better proximity be a better player on approach? Um, yeah. I think so. I mean, I don't know much about like, other than the fact that proximity is flawed for like weird reasons, like some of the shots that count for it don't make sense, but, and it doesn't take into account distance, but um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what you mean. Like, I, no, I think you, yeah, I think okay. you're right about that and not taking into account distance and stuff. And like, like a par five, someone's go, going at a par five and two, you know, and they put it in the, maybe intentionally put it in like the front green side bunker or something like that. Well, maybe that gets a bad proximity number, but if he'd laid up to a hundred yards and then put it to 10 feet, that gets, you know, a better number. Yeah. And actually someone emailed me, uh, just a writer, a writer who was looking into this emailed me asking why Cantley, Patrick Cantley is so, he has such good approach strokes game numbers, but his proximity numbers are crap. And he was thinking he had two hypotheses. Like his first hypothesis was just, okay, maybe Cantley goes for the greens more. And so he's hitting shots in further distances, but that wasn't, that's not what was going on. All it was, was just courses differ like massively in proximity. Like there's some courses where it's everybody's hitting it, hitting it to 20 feet and then others where it's 50. So like to the point earlier, if you just normalize proximity, 
my tournament round, like it'll be a lot better. And that actually got all the way there for Cantley. Like he is good relative to the field, just not, he plays high proximity courses. So that's why he seems bad in the ranking. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's kind of go back to this because I, I think you guys were getting onto something and then it sounded like you guys were like not wanting to talk about your secret proprietary approach to things. Um, what, which, which parts of the game tend to be more predictive, I guess is the question, because ultimately when you're creating a model or you're using data, you're trying to find inefficiencies in the market, i.e. things that your model can, you know, ways that your model can predict things that the, the average eye wouldn't. So if, if we talk about the most basic thing that everyone has, it's what it's their score, right? Like how has a player been doing on, based on their score? And, you know, obviously the strokes gain piece it, 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 at the end of the day, the, the score is the score, right? Like, you know, I mean, like it's, it's, it's the strokes gain doesn't. So you, you have to actually like partition off pieces of strokes gain for it to be a useful stat, right? Like you guys talked about strokes gain putting or strokes gain driving or whatnot. So which pieces of it are more predictive and how do you guys incorporate, like which pieces of that do you actually incorporate into your model building? that you think gives you an advantage. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much of an advantage it's giving us, but like we're trying to incorporate the fact that uh, off the tee, so like distance and it's intuitive. So distance is something that's more predictable. Like off the tee strokes gain is mostly driven by how far you're hitting it. That was one of Brody's big insights when he came out with the strokes gain stuff is distance is being closer to the hole is ultimately what matters most in golf, not necessarily whether you're in the fairway or rough. And so off the tee is really is predictive for short, a short periods of time, which makes sense because you don't just lose or gain distance overnight. Um, whereas a pro, like putting performance is really, and again, people, anybody who plays golf would agree with this. Like it's, it's really high variance, varies a lot day to day. So we, like we try and incorporate, we try and leverage the fact that you need a small sample of data to estimate off the tee skill. And you need a big sample to estimate putting and around the green, around the green skill. So if we see a player who, recently is putting poorly, but on the long term, he's been an average putter. We're not going to, his recent scores have been driven by bad putting and we're not going to weight that as much as if we were just looking at scores and we didn't know the, the cause of his recent bad play. And we're going to, that's how we're going to adjust. We're going to give him a positive bump essentially. But I mean, it's not like the thing with golf is like you spend a month, like I spend a month working on this and incorporating it and it's quite nice. And, and it barely helps. So it's, it's, uh, it's golf. I don't know. I mean, it's, that's what I said earlier. Like it's hard to incorporate strokes gain stuff in a way that's, I don't know, that's super helpful. I've, I honestly, in all my, these few years now working on this, I've never had a moment where it's this massive boost in predictive power. And it's like, Oh, wow. Like, I guess this is what I was missing. It's always, okay. I think this third decimal place in the, in the air is uh -huh. smaller, <laughs> So it's, I mean, it's frustrating in that respect, but that's the intuition there. I think makes sense. It's just not as great as I would have hoped, but yeah, that's one way you can use strokes game categories to help. Yeah. So then what, and so then what's the, go ahead, Rufus. I was going to echo. I, I think one, the, another reason that strokes gain off the T is going to be more predictive, I think um, is, is essentially there's going to be, well, everybody's starting from the same place. They're starting from the T box. Um, and so it might essentially just be a measurement thing too. Like if everybody was starting from the same place on an approach or, you know, and we were able to know their lie, like with certainty to lie or whether there was, you know, a tree, right. You know, two guys are in the rough. One guy has a tree in front of him and has to punch out and the other guy doesn't like strokes gain doesn't know that it, they just know in the rough 160 yards out. So basically I think like measurement error, well, not measurement error, but essentially the deficiencies of, of, of what is incorporated in the strokes gain um, is going to make sort of the approach statistic a little bit less predictive going forward, whereas uh, relative to off the tee. So, so what is then the holy grail for you guys? If you had access to all, you know, like if, if you had charters following every golfer with GPS and they do, blah, blah, blah. They do, they do have that. You don't, you don't have access to that, do you? you? You're not telling those charters what you, what you want them to actually record, right? Oh, like, you're not like record. You, like, hey, there's a tree here. 
Yeah, no, I mean, like, what are you laughing about, Rufus? This is like, I'm saying like the way to improve statistics, right, or in, in data is to actually have someone go and qualitatively, this is like what our friend Ted does, right, at StatsBomb, is to qualitatively look at things, situations that, you know, can't be measured by sort of a very strict rubric, right? Like you're like, if, if you actually like grade the quality of the lie or you, you know, like, the, like what would you guys want in your, in your ideal world if you were having like literally people follow the golfers and chart what you want them to chart? Do you think there would be a way to get an advantage there? Or is it, you know, like, I mean, like Matthew, you, you sort of seem like a little bit resigned to the fact that like, golf is really hard, which is interesting because you have a data golf company. So it's like, what is, what is your aspiration in terms of how to improve things? Yeah. I mean, to the point about what I would want, I mean, I think there's things, there's certainly more information I'd want to know what a shot. The question is, like I said earlier, we need a decent chunk of data to say anything. We need to see a golfer hit, you know, hundreds of shots to really assess his skill at some uh, category of shot in golf so if I don't know if all these things were we were recording like let's say on putts you're getting them re to record whether it was downhill or uphill or whether it was a I mean you can actually figure that out already in the data shot level data but the thing is if these things all cancel out like roughly speaking when you when you look at a, a big sample of data which is what you need to estimate golfer skill then it doesn't really matter for like predictive power I mean obviously there's always going to be an edge in knowing this information because we know in golf, we you need to weight recent data better. So, or sorry, more. So the, the higher quality is the data, the more accurate are your assessments of their recent performance. And that does matter. Um, and I mean, you know, the fact that I'm, I sound resigned about predicting golf. I mean, I, I'm still trying to figure out exactly. It does seem to me that the, the, the boost and predictive power that we get are, are very small, but I don't from adding some new component, but, I also don't have, I currently don't have a great system for evaluating. I make some change and then back test on, let's say ultimately we care about betting results. I don't have a great way of like making a change and then simulating five years of matchup bets and seeing how much better that model does. Cause that's ultimately the outcome that I care about. Let's say I don't really do that right now for several reasons. It just would take a long time being the main one. So I, it's not that I'm resigned. I still, I'm actually very motivated to make the model better. And I think, we can make it better. It's just, it's not like, I don't know what it's like in other sports, but I, I haven't really had these eureka moments where there's a huge boost in predictive power. And I honestly, I don't think there would be in other sports either, but. It's like the 80, 20 rule, right? I mean, at this point you're like 96% of the way there and trying to find the other four, you know, trying to find those last 4% are really, it's really tough. And that's kind of how I think it, it's that way. And, in every in every sport or, or in a lot of things outside of sports as well one thing i think would be interesting is is um you know the track man data though so basically like the pga releases some of that stuff um and i think maybe now with the partnership with aws and i don't know i'm, I'm hoping at some point maybe that that'll be more available like at a shot level but um with, without errors because when I've, I've looked into that so for example you can see a guy's like spin rate or you know, average ball speed or, you know, um, apex height for tee shots, uh, you know, on the PGA tour, you can only see like a summary of that though, not uh, on individual shot. And, you know, when it, when I, when I see like a guy's tee shot in the range of his launch angle and it's negative 40 degrees to positive 20 degrees, I'm like, there's definitely some measurement error in there. So, but I do think that the, I mean, if you think about what a player can control, like, I mean, there's a lot you can't control. You, you, you can, you don't know what, you know, I mean, the winds can affect this ball a certain way, you know, the humidity, um, how it lands on the green bounces and all that stuff. But, but you can control like your swing speed, like the, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a physicist, but I mean, I, I would think that that's kind of the, the most granular thing, right? Like, like what is the curve you're putting on the ball? Like what is, the launch angle of it, et cetera, and how consistent you are with that kind of thing. And, and sort of looking and seeing almost like for baseball, when, when a pitcher is, when pitcher's velocity has dropped in recent starts, it's an indication generally that um, maybe he's battling an injury or something, but he's probably likely to underperform. And 
similarly, if you see some guy, a golfer isn't hitting the ball as, as hard or his spin rates less or something, if you sort of, sort of see changes, maybe they could be the precursor of bad performance rather than um, like reacting to the bad performance. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I kind of go back to this and, 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 and it's interesting, like you, again, like if everyone has the same data, right? Like it's not like, and everyone has like similar skill sets and similar approaches, right? Like you have an econ degree, Rufus has an econ degree, wh whatever, right? Like um, yeah. what, what I guess, like, what I guess, like I wonder, and I think about, right? Ultimately, I, I want to go back to the same idea and the same concept. And I think Rufus, you were getting at something interesting, which is, you know, the track man data, which mm -hmm. is, you know, spin rate, launch angle, all that kind of stuff that may be like more predictive, um, and, but ultimately what you're trying to do is find like where your scores, where your actual score is lying, right? Like where it's, where it's not telling the whole story. So like, what are some, some things that you guys have seen? Like you've talked about one thing is as putting or holing out, like somewhat being random, right? Like that. So that's an area where a score may, you know, may be lying or maybe not telling the whole story. What are some other areas that you guys have found that the score w would isn't telling me the whole story like you know like i mean quote unquote like there's just concepts of getting lucky right um you know probably like a drive being inches away from going into the you know trap or going into something but ending up fine. like what what are some of those situations that you guys have seen system systematically that um create inefficiencies I don't know if they create inefficiencies, but I mean, think about Kevin Na. Um, Kevin Na's, what, what did he have, a 21 or 19 or whatever it was on, um, it was in at the Houston Open back in 2010 or 2011. I mean, I basically was, well, sort of, I, I, I think sort of those extreme scores can bias things. And, and like Justin Rose with the nine on, um, on the third hole in round four last week. And I think that's one example. So another example you guys are saying is, is just like individual blow ups on holes, right? Like not necessarily like really over. So, okay. That, that's. I mean, Rose hit three guess. balls in the water. So I mean, penalties is a, uh, but I, I don't think all penalties are created equal either. I will say like um, a penalty for like the ball moving. I mean, when you see sort of these ticky tack penalties, the one like Mackenzie Hughes had one a few weeks back where, he grounded the club behind the ball and it moved, it was deemed to have moved a little bit and he got assessed a one stroke penalty. Like, I don't think, I mean, unless you're Patrick Reed, like, you know, Patrick Reed is the outlier there of guys that like do those types of things a lot. And I mean, it probably helps his game a ton um, in getting away with it most of the time. But, uh, but I mean, I, I don't think that's predictive, right? I would, I would be, I, I wanna, if I find out about that, I wanna subtract that stroke for predictive purposes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, penalties is interesting. I don't know. Penalties, I would think intuitively I, that penalties wouldn't be that predictive, but at the same time, just as a golfer, it is, it is somewhat predictive when a guy bombs one out of bounds and it's a shot you just absolutely can't hit. There is a, in some sense, there is a big signal there because that's like for Spieth. I mean, for Spieth's a good example. Like right now, Spieth, the last few tournaments he's played he's still been squirrely off the tee but he hasn't hit he hasn't had any massive misses and for the last year that's speed consistently once or twice around would bomb one like 50 yards out of bounds and i don't know that does actually provide a, provide a strong signal so penalty strokes are a bit weird in that respect but i agree on the there's definitely something there with the uh like guys three putting from three feet or just making big scores in general i think we don't adjust for that or anything right now but i think there's something to that for sure. I mean, I think well, what's interesting is that penalties, like if you have a penalty stroke, I mean, obviously out of bounds is different than water too, but, but it, it tells you something about your dispersion. I think that's what we really want to know how, how like basically what is this guy's miss? How big is the miss? But the problem is in the data, you don't know where the guy's aiming. You know, he could be on this approach aiming to the middle of the green, or he could be aiming at the pin. We don't get that data. And so I think if we had that data and we are able to know I mean, maybe like if you got that off the range in practice or, you know, something like that, like 
you could have like, I think knowing a, a player's dispersion would be really important. And especially for course fit too, um, where there's courses where you can miss big and there's courses where you can't. Yeah. I think this stuff sounds good in theory. Like certainly I agree. Like it's, it's nice in some sense to think, Oh, like forget about scores. Like scores is just this like thing that we see. It's the product of a player's skills. Let's just focus in on players' skills. And if we measure those accurately, then we'll be able to better predict score because that's what determines score. I think that's, that's, it's nice thinking, but I don't think it, it can maybe add value to scores. It's just, there's so many things that go into a golfer's score that are like somewhat untangible and are hard to pick up in the data. I would worry that you would get somewhat, it's like, yeah, like you would agree, like the more granular, granular your model is, the more opportunity there is for it to get way off. Yep. And for, so like maybe, if, I mean, it could add value if you use this in conjunction with, scores and everything we already use but it's swing speed is a good one i like that like if you see a guy it'd be interesting like it'd be interesting to have numbers on a guy's range session and try and make adjustments off that but that's like i mean who knows what a player is doing on the range like it's... i mean uh, somebody told me who had like that actually from trackman data they um players hit the ball harder on the range than they do on the course, which was really surprising to me because when you see them on the range, it looks like they're just kind of relaxing and warming up. But I mean, but generally they'll hit the ball, like their eight iron on the range is going to be hit harder with more swing speed than on the course. I mean, maybe that's just because they're trying to figure out what their limitations are, I guess. They have the, they have the nuclear one and then their stock one. Well, I mean, I, I mean, just you guys, to your point of uh, we've all of us who play golf, like you're probably not doing your most accurate shot when you're swinging as hard as you can. Right. I mean, like the, the idea of like, you know, going yeah. easy a little bit does make sense. Right. On the course, like to try to like, ra rather than trying to hit it. So again, like this, I, I'm like kind of fascinated because like you guys are probably two of the most preeminent golf, like modelers in the world. Right. Market and influencers. What's that? We're influencers of the market. Regard, irregardless of whether you're influencers or what we call you, right? And I don't know if you guys are just being cagey or what, but like it doesn't, you're not getting me very excited about the opportunities to create more predictive, you know, to get bigger edges in golf based on data or approaches. Like you're just kind of like are spitballing. Like what are the okay. things that like, Go ahead. Well, Jeff, I, I, a lot of where the edges are are going to be figuring out like a player's fit for a particular course, or okay. and obviously and a player if he's if he's hot or cold, right? I mean, basically his deviations from his baseline skill that might have some predictive value. But I think I mean course fit is is I think big. Like I mean, for example, this week maybe we'll talk about let's talk about the players a little bit. Like the players is a course that has a lot of variance. Um, and it's a course in general where, and uh, Matt, tell me if you, you disagree with any of this, but but where overall, um, I guess a player's skill is generally a little bit less important, meaning that a better player, like a player that's a stroke better than another player may only be like 0.98 strokes better um, than the player on this particular course. But a lot of that is gonna be related to the win too. And if you look at history from the players, like, I mean, it in general, I'm showing like wind rounds average, like it averaged like 12 miles an hour per, um, per day. Um, average for, well, looking at the average, the five hours after a guy teed off. Um, but it's going to be the condition, like more wind is going to also, is going to equal more randomness generally. And we're supposed to have pretty benign conditions this week, which basically says to me that I, I'm making an adjustment and saying, I'm get, we're going to take away a little bit of that randomness. That's my sort of course randomness effect, um, which I manually did. I normally don't do that, but I was like, you know, look, but that's one area where, I mean, where it matters. Another thing, wind matters more on court, um, like a mile an hour of wind matters more in Florida than it does on a typical course. Um, it matters more in Europe as well. I mean, and a lot of that's, I, I think it comes from the fact that Florida is, is flat. You don't sort of have like a bunch of trees um, you know, you don't have these forests, basically the wind it, it's open, it's more exposed. And so, um, I mean, maybe it has to do, it, it, I might be completely off base there. Maybe it's like correlated. Maybe it's just because there's more 
water hazards on these Florida courses. So like wind can just have a greater impact on your score in that regard. But, um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think there's all these, th I mean, things on course fit and, and obviously this, yeah, a ton, there's a ton of variance in at the players, but I, I know the narrative is like, oh, there's not one type of golfer that, that it favors. Um, you had like, what, two years ago, you had Rory win. And I think Jim Furyk was in second place. Um, you had Ken Duke like shoot the um, probably the best round ever there uh, at the players. He shot like 11 strokes better than average in like 2016. And he's like a, a guy who's, um, you know, not at all. I, I don't know, not, not, not sort of the typical guy that's going to go re really go low either. So. so let me just summarize what you just said. Basically, you said, hey, an advantage is looking at course fit and then proceeded to say that the players, there's no such thing as course fit because it's all random. No, it's not all random. There's certain things that I think it favors. Okay, so I mean, tell I'm us sure. what it favors. Like what, who I'll let Matt say that. Who are the golfers well, that you're looking at this week? Well, randomness, the fact that a course is random is course fit. Like the fact that, like if you had to pick a course that you were going to play, I don't know if you golf or not, but like if you're going to play a tour professional at a course, you'd want to pick a course that doesn't reward skill. Like that's a good course fit for the worst golfer. And so that's, I mean, obviously every course rewards skill, but there's some that reward skill more than others, or at least the skills that are on the PJ tour players possess. So yeah, good course fit at like at a high level at, at Sawgrass, which is this week's course. Um, we're generally betting on worst golfers this week and all the pretty much, yeah, all the, all the top 15 players in our, whatever baseline rankings are getting negative adjustments to their skill levels this week, just because Sawgrass, it doesn't reward uh, distance as much as a normal course. It rewards accuracy more, but accuracy tends to be a skill possessed by like not the top golfers. I mean, they, they are accurate, but it's typically like mid to top tier guys are, are more accurate. So that results sort of in a compression of the, the skill distribution too. And then, yeah, just the other, other than accuracy, every skill is rewarded less at Sawgrass, which is a, a course fit thing. Um, so does a guy like Morikawa show up well this week because he's accurate, not particularly long? Yeah, I don't have him. I, of, I don't have him that high actually. I mean, I have him forty six to one, which seems, yeah. What yeah, about well, you, I mean, Matthew? Uh, I mean, of the top guys, which Morikawa is sort of on the cusp for us. He's not. I know he just won, but he's sort of on the periphery of the top he's get, he's he's getting a positive adjustment this week for course fit which is uh yeah of the top of our top like 15 guys it's him and, and webb simpson who are the only guys getting uh positive bumps and that makes sense they're both accurate guys um of the really good guys like rom is getting less of john rom is getting less of a negative adjustment just because he actually is he's long and accurate he's very but, accurate yeah which is rare for a big guy but um but you yeah. guys, I mean, do you like Ryan Moore as much as I do? I mean, it's funny. I mean, I had him highlighted for this. Yeah, I mean, our model likes him. I personally probably wouldn't bet my house on him because I don't even – I didn't even know he – he hasn't done anything he lately. But, so I'm not sure I believe the adjustments he's getting, but, um, yeah, we like him. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't bet my house on anything. Especially like, I mean, you don't I, actually I have a you don't, you don't whole have portfolio a of big long shots here. I mean, like, you, I think I took Rufus, Bo Hogue you, you, at 800 to you, one. Rufus, you rent a house, right? So how could you bet a house? Well, I could bet one of the houses I own that, that, that I'm renting out. <laughs> but then where would the renters live? <laughs> You're right. That's a good question. That's why I don't do it. Um, okay. So who, all right. So let's just get into this, this tournament then. What, like beyond... Ryan Moore and, and Rom, who are some other interesting, you know, I don't know if I need to ask you about specific guys, but, um, you know, like if, if you think about one of the things that I've learned um, from uh, doing this podcast, which is good that I've actually learned something is this idea of recency in golf, you know, almost a counter to uh, some of the other sports where recency tends to create um inefficiency meaning like people overweight recency too much in golf recency is a, is a really big driver or really predictive right like that's one of the areas that you guys believe so like in a ryan moore situation right like i don't even know if he's played right to you guys' point like i haven't heard his name in, in a while um who are some of the players that you guys are looking at from a recent standpoint 
that are that are interesting that you think have value. I mean, we talked about we talked about Spieth, right? Spieth has been playing really well this entire um, you know season so far, right? Like at least recently, he's been he's been in the mix in in many of these many of these tournaments. Um, Morikawa certainly. I, I, I don't know if you guys heard the narrative or like about his putting and, and his, his chipping, like he's, you he got lessons from, from whatever Marco Mera or whomever. And, and that's why he putted so well, um, you know, at uh, where, where was that? I don't even remember now. It's concession. Like, oh, yeah, uh, concession. Okay. Um, who are some guys that you guys are looking at from a recency standpoint? I mean, I think the market is, yeah, Matt, uh, I was gonna say in general, like we're we we we're probably less on recent form than the market, and even amongst like sharps, we definitely uh, are more on long term form. And it's something I'm like working on right now. I'm not sure if we we might be too long term, but uh, anyway, related to that, we actually like Connors a lot this week, which is uh, and so Corey Connors, he played well last week, which is like it's super rare for a player who's not a top guy to have a really good week. And then for us to not, for us to show value on him the next week is pretty rare. Part of that is because Connors is a good fit this week. Like we were talking earlier, he's an accurate player. Um, I'm not really sure. I think even, even last week we, we liked Connors. So we were high on him to begin with, but uh, he's a guy we like. I don't really know. Cause he can't yeah. putt. <laughs> yeah, I was on. That's yeah. I liked him too last week. Do you like Connors this week, Rufus? What do you make him? Um, I don't, I, I make him 82 to one. So, I mean, just looking around, it looks like FanDuel has or had a 90 to one out there, but generally the market is around like, let's see, 66, 65. Like it, market is generally in the sixties to eighties on him. Pinnacle is 55 to one. So. What about um, guys, your, your SCH guys that you love so much a couple of weeks ago, Rufus, oh, Scheffler and Shoffley. And Shoffley. Shoffley and Scheffler. You asked me for two. Yeah, you asked, Jeff asked me for some golf picks. So I just said anybody that's name starts with SCH um, for that week. That, that was the out. Sega Genesis. It didn't work out so well. Yeah, um, I don't like, I mean, I make Shoffley 25 to one. I guess the best, the best market price is 24 to one out there. So I'm not like low on him and Scheffler. I make him 50 to one. And I guess the best market price looks like it's 50 to one at DraftKings. So no value there really, but I do like Rom. What did you price Rom at? Um, I, I had him at um, like, pl like plus 1560. Um, and then I made some adjustments after the weather and all that. And I'm now having him at plus 1490. And he, he's, I have him as the favorite. So normally I would have, normally I have the favorite a lot higher than plus 1490. And to Matt's point, that's why randomness does matter. The fact that there is more variance here does bring more golfers in. And it means I'm not going to be as high on the, on the, on the best golfers. Has Rom been playing? Yeah, not that well for him, but <laughs> he has been. I mean, and he apparently Rom hates this course. Hates so, it? Yeah, he said that. Well, I mean, there's something to be said for but him hating this course. This is a course where, well, what's interesting, I mean, this is a course, oh, I'm like, should I say this or not say this? Um, you do a podcast, Rufus, say it. No, okay, no this one... is, I mean, this is a course where course history just doesn't really matter much. Got it. It really, like, like course fit matters, but course history, like how a, a guy overperforming or underperforming there in the past, like it's, it's at the extreme end of it not mattering. It's kind of interesting, right? That's that seems counter to what you would think. So why I mean, why think, do you why do you think that is? I think part of that is because, I mean, honestly, I think this is like super interesting. It's not actually. I don't think it's too relevant for predicting stuff. So I'll just say it anyway. I think the re, the thing with the players is if you're if you're eligible, you play in the players. So there's no at some courses the fact that a player keeps playing it gives you information about how they feel about the course because. Like the fact that I'm going out of my way to play this event in Florida, um, I'm, I'm putting that on my schedule. If it's a mid-tier event, there's information in that. And I think that tells you that the, the player likes the course. Whereas the, play, the, the player's championship and the majors, if you're eligible, you play in it. So I think that's partly why, at least, I mean, it depends how we're talking about course history, but normally rounds played is pretty predictive at a course. 
And like you could think, oh, it's because it's experience. The player has played a course a lot. They know the course well, and that that benefits them. But I don't think it's that because that just doesn't make sense to me. I think it's more, it's like revealed preference. When you see where a player is playing, it tells you about how they feel about the course. And um, the players, there could be other reasons too, like just because it's, I don't know, it's more I, it is more random. I think experience still matters there. And to your point, like think about Augusta yeah, National. Yeah. It's another course where basically anybody that's eligible is going to play. But that's an extreme. That 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 that's at the other extreme of like course history really matters. Like experience matters a good amount too. Well, but there's experience and then there's course history, right? There's oh yeah, they're different. But you're, but you're but you're saying experience. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I haven't really tried to figure out too much like the differing degrees of predictiveness about course history, just because it's and and it, at, at specific courses, just because it's. Kind of, it's difficult, but anyway, it's. I'm sure you've looked into it deeply. It's it's difficult. There's not there's much some strange there. things. Like for whatever reason, course history matters a lot less in Florida than it does elsewhere on tour. Yeah, I don't know if I, I don't know if I believe that, but <laughs> I mean, that's uh, like Rufus this, this is this is like this is like a one in ten thousand or more chance that it's random though. So, well, there's a lot of. There's, yeah. It's true. There are. Yeah, how many... <laughs> yeah, but um, how many it's like it's like Europeans at Bay Hill, right? So let's let's go back. Let let's go back really quickly to this this concept of um, w why do you think that the players is is something that people play? Like if they it means they like that course, they like the event. No, it's like the, it's like it's the biggest purse in golf. It's like the fifth major. It's yeah. It's like not playing it. Who, but is it, is it, I mean, like, is it the, it, I mean, I guess like with all the WGC events, like, is it really the fifth major now or is it, I mean, it's still considered that. WGC events are, yeah. Yeah, the players is a great event for whatever reason. The WGCs just suck for some reason. It's, maybe, it's cause it's, maybe, it's, maybe it's because there's no cut or they, they just don't have, like as a golf fan, I, I don't enjoy the WGCs at all. The players is up there with, with the majors in terms of like this will be a great week this week it's partly the course partly the the field i mean it's yeah the players is the fifth major as far as i'm concerned interesting yeah all right um should we get into some of the like maybe market gambling type stuff um rather sure. than golf specific discussion i i actually solicited some, i solicited some uh some questions and you know um let's see do to do Okay, um, so there is a large contingent of people that believes you have a very large impact on, on the opening line. Data Golf has a big impact on the opening lines out there. Um, do you, if a large bookmaker approached you to sell lines for their matchups as their originators for good money, would you accept? This is a question. Um, no, so to the second question, no, no, I don't think we would. I mean, obviously everybody has a price, but we really enjoy having like this website. For one, we didn't start the website for betting purposes. We initially were just big fans of golf, knew a lot about data and combined, the, combined those two things. Um, but we really enjoy having a public facing website. Um, I enjoy being on this side of the, the market, the side that in theory is helping betters, even though bookmakers might be using our stuff to set lines too, I don't know. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't think we would. Plus I'm, my brother and I were young. I don't want to, I don't know. It would take a lot of money to stop what we're doing and just sort of do something boring and give our lines to a bookmaker. But I mean, obviously everybody has a price, but that's, yeah. Take note bookmakers. Did Ryan Moore pull out of the players, by the way? Because I'm looking at him right now in, in, in the futures, and I don't even see him in the futures. Of which book? Uh, of of see, Chris. J Jeff always J – Jeff, like, literally places most of his bets during the podcast. Basically, anything that's talked about, Jeff places the bet before the podcast airs. R Rufus, that would be illegal, so I would never do that. And I don't it would know be illegal? Yeah, you, you, can't, you can't bet illegal. You're not allowed to bet while you're recording a podcast. Everybody knows that. Section two, number nine in the U.S. legal code. Um, I'm looking That's at what Ryan. You can. 
What's that? I said Matt's in Canada, so he could. Okay, Rufus, do you want to ask him a few more of these questions? Yeah, and obviously, Jeff, you chime in. Um, do you think, I guess the think. real question is, do you, do you, do you, do you think that um, you do have a big impact on the opening lines, Matthew? I mean, I don't think we're impacting literally the opening line. I think that for whatever reason, at least let's say in, okay, so I mean, for, for week longs and outright stuff, it does seem like somehow, even before we, because we don't post our stuff until, at least for the outright stuff, books have posted and then we, we post our stuff. And, and lately, yeah, they have been super in line with our stuff. And I'm not really sure how it's even possible because at least most weeks we have reasonable, you could go to our website and look at our, some of our pages and get a good assessment of our general skill baseline skill for each golfer. But each week there's like course fit stuff, course history. I don't know. There's course specific adjustments. So like it shouldn't be that in line, but lately it has kind of been in line um, this week. Not so much for matchups. We don't impact like the opening lines of like the actual openers for pinnacle are always quite a bit different than ours. I mean, I think if you actually looked at the, the odds data, you would see this. Um, we certainly impact like, okay, so Pinnacle will open like this week and yeah, whatever. And their limits are probably low and we'll, yeah, we'll impact, or I don't know if it's us, but lines will move toward, well, I'm just saying lines will move towards our odds initially. And, and then when Chris comes out on Tuesday and when the limits go up, sure, they do, they can move away. And honestly, I haven't systematically looked at, I did systematically look at things the last two years. But this year, I don't know. It seems to me that closing lines are more in line with our stuff than in the past. But anyway, we do. I think we influence the market a reasonable lot. I'm not really sure. I don't really have anything to compare it to. And plus, I think everybody overestimates how much they influence the market. That's like a every well, gambler. I, I think the consensus, think the consensus in the gambling world is you guys underestimate how much you impact the market. But someone, um, someone mentioned that um, basically it seems like Penny, Penny might, will open, Pinnacle will open without, you know, and you guys will show value and someone will be popping it for a hundred dollars and basically put everything in line with your numbers. And then, and then, so it's essentially early on da the data golf number ends up becoming the market. And then later on you have um, some sharps and bigger players that are sort of moving that sort of away. So when you guys post your records, I mean, you, so you keep bet your betting records, um, against bet 365 lines when are those when are those bets but but here's the thing like you're essentially like when are those bets placed first off whenever whenever bet 365 posts their stuff i mean bet 365 is not like pinnacle and they're not like that chris they are not i mean i don't think they're they're not influenced by anything and it's, that's probably because it's their business model probably and people think and they're not we we pay we place our bets there or whatever record our bets when those lines come out, um, and I don't think there's much influence going on between us and their odds. I don't think we're not we're definitely if you're trying to get at whether or not we're betting against odds that have already incorporated yeah. our stuff and then we're, they're moving away. I honestly don't think that is happening that much for the outright markets. It might be now because like now it's getting a bit worrisome to the point where we don't show there's weeks where we literally show no value in the outright market, which is once you start tweaking players' skill levels, you realize that it doesn't take much to get value on a golfer in an outright market. And so that's obviously there's something kind of fishy going on there, but like I said, this week, there's a lot of discrepancies. So it's not always like that. Um, and yeah, related to this is people underestimate. I know people think bet six fives lines are horrible, but I don't know if you, if you look at, I've looked at how they compare to, other books. And I think all matchup markets are actually relatively pretty efficient, but well, they have those stupid tie like three way tournament matchup markets. So it's like impossible to find value just because it takes a lot more juice where, where ties, right. ties are a but separate round, category. Tournament matchups, yeah, but round matchups, they don't. And uh, yeah, there is a lot of VIG and, but matchup markets are unique. Like they books get to choose which players to offer. So you can have a crap or maybe not so great model and or not even have a model i don't know and still price matchups okay I, I don't know i worry about matchups like i don't know i can't imagine we're doing anything wrong really like i don't know why a model would need to be different for matchups like our philosophy has always just been we're trying to model 
scores. And then right. from, from scores, you get everything you want. But yeah, I don't know. Matchups, especially round matchups, there can be weird things like guys who are not going to make the cut or guys who are near the lead or these things might matter more than skill. And we try and account for them, but it's tricky. So, I mean, you're, so first off, like, I mean, your business model, well, you sell, I mean, you have a subscription service, um, which sells things. It's you sell, you sell picks. So in that way you might be considered a tout, but you also are selling the output of your numbers, almost like more like, I mean, a more advanced version of what Massey Peabody did, did well, except Massey Peabody didn't sell, but, but, but basically, you know, you're offering, you know, tools to enable people to see, you know, based off of your numbers. Um, but I guess the question then is if, I mean, and this is the sort of thing that we have obviously have talked about touts a lot on our podcast over the years, but, um, and, and sort of the economics of selling picks and the fact that with, with market influence come like, with more market influence, the picks become less valuable to people. Um, your numbers, as your numbers get more and more um, ingrained into the into the market number, how does that sort of affect the product you deliver? Um, and obviously, you deliver like I mean, I'm a subscriber because of the API. Like I like the data, the data side of of data golf, and I know a lot of people. Um, I know a lot of people do that as well. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't say like you're strictly a tout side or anything, but um, yeah, how do you how do you sort of reconcile that in terms of where you think the site is headed as you, you know, because presumably you're not like, as your numbers, as you get more and more subscribers, you know, it will, you will influence the market even more. And if your numbers, you know, you're working on all this stuff um, and I would encourage you to stop doing any research on golf um, permanently, um, but, if you, you know, you know, as you make improvements, it's gonna, you know, you'll end up affecting the market more. So how do you sort of like, what, what, what's, what's the future for data golf in that regard? And how do you sort of reconcile that? Yeah. I mean, first off, I'm, I don't mind being called a, calling our site a tout site. I'm whatever. I'm fine with that. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I think we're still, I don't think we're, yeah, it's not like there's just picks on our site. You get to see, uh, like first and foremost, I think it's just a super high quality website that people get a lot of enjoyment from. And you're not necessarily, if sure, if you're purely like there for financial reasons and um, you just want to get these picks at a value, then sure, as we get more subscribers and more market influence, that is going to become more problematic. I think it's also useful for, for people to see, like we're not just emailing out picks. We're obviously, we're not, we don't do that, but we're, um, we're showing you how the sausage is made pretty much exactly. So somebody can come in and look at our model and add, like we're giving a really good baseline and sometimes how I think about it and they can come in and add like, like honestly myself, like I think our picks are pretty much or our, our odds for a week are set on Sunday, but as someone who watches a lot of golf, like I think I could add value to our model for sure, making manual tweaks and stuff like that. And going forward, we are trying to, formally allow people to do that with some new tools on the site that are going to allow people to make some adjustments to some inputs and then re-simulate the tournament and it'll give them basically their personal odd stream that has the probabilities that would come out of their model um, but we're going to try and do it in a way that's actually useful for the user like because most custom products it just spits out garbage for the users because <laughs> it's really hard to make a custom product that's actually good because if you're not a, not a technical person it's hard to uh, it's hard to build a model in a smart way, but I don't know. To your point, like I, sure, we, I honestly, we never get complaints from people about them not being able to find value or we, whatever the ceiling is in terms of how many subscribers we can hold um, before there's just too many there and it's affecting the market too much. I don't know. We haven't, we haven't hit that yet, but like, what do you think about the fact that people know Pinnacle is sharp, for example, and yet every book is not in line with Pinnacle? Like, I know this is there's that's based on business models, but my, my point is just there can be sharp, there is sharp lines out there all the time. It's pinnacle. And yet not every line gets back into pinnacle into the uh, down to pinnacle's closing line. Like there's I don't know, it's not like the market's a big place. It's there's it's global, there's value to be had and maybe what I'm saying is naive and stupid. It probably is, but that's <laughs> sort of one one uh, 
thing that comes to mind. I don't know. I mean, Rufus, you're asking him to solve the existential question of basically how to make yeah. money as a, no, I mean, this is like the classic question. Like it, you, like how many times do people ask you, oh, I have this great analytic system for betting X sport. How do I make money off of it? And they want to like start a company to do that. And, you know, like it's, it's not easy. And I, and, and you know, the best way to make money off of it is to go bet it yourself. Right. Like that's ultimately, you know, I, I think it'll be interesting to chart your progress, Matthew, and we're certainly pulling for you. And we, we thank you for joining us today. Rufus, do you have one more question? Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I love the idea of the, I mean, the customization stuff, just allowing someone like, cause it's, it's like telling someone the answer versus allowing someone to find the answer themselves. Right. And I think I, it comes down to, I guess, what do people get? Why do people bet on golf or on any sport? Like Jeff, why do you bet on, why do you bet on basketball or what, or whatever? I mean, you're it's on? different though for me, right? Because I, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm much more recreational than, than you guys are. No, right? But I, I'm, like, that's what I'm talking about. Like more like, yeah. I mean, we're not talking about professional betters. Well, but just now you're wild. you're basically now like you're you're now singing the praises of why touts should exist, right? Like no, no, I, I I'm saying I, I'm not I'm saying I like the concept of allowing someone to figure out the answers themselves and giving them tools to do so, rather than saying this is this is the well, well, this sure. is our number. It's saying like oh, you know, you can put in your own numbers and run a simulation, which that, I mean, I love yeah, that. Rufus, I love it. That's... You, this is, of course you like it, but you're not the typical sports fan, right? The typical sports fan wants to be spoon fed information. They don't want to actually have to do work to get that, that information. Right. I want data golf to have a, the, the product that allows people to run their own simulations, but just not have any of their data golf numbers up there so that people have to do it all themselves. Because <laughs> you want I mean, people to, to make mistakes. I, I want the so market to more... be as inefficient as possible, Jeff. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I, I'm um, obviously biased observer here. Matthew, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, super interesting work you guys are doing. Wish you the best of luck going forward. Um, and any any last thoughts on the players, guys, for, for those people who managed to get through this entire podcast? I think, pe might want I think people are going to want a few picks here, right? Even though I hate yes. giving out picks, but like... Do it, Matt. Matt, what are the what are what do you what are the who are the players that you guys' model has the biggest discrepancy with relative to the market? I mean, it's a sad list of players. Like, yeah, so Ryan yeah. Moore is the, is the is the biggest discrepancy. Like, yeah, guys like Adam Long. I mean, Connors is a good Corey Connors. Is a, he's not a super long shot, and he's. I know we already mentioned him, but he's someone that I actually look at and think, yeah, that's. Uh, that's actually a reasonable, like it, the data supports it and my personal opinion support it. Um, yeah, there's not too many other noteworthy. Brandon Todd too, actually. Is guy I like Todd. Um, so I, I, I like Ryan Moore. I mean, I, I like Rom outright at 16 to one or better, I guess. I was able to get a 17 to one. There's a, well, nah, there was a 17 to one out there. I'm not sure it exists anymore. Um, if you can get 90 to one or greater on Billy Horschel, the local Floridian, um, I like that, but yeah, I, I hate, like, a bunch I hate of, listening to that dude talk. He just never stops talking. It's like, well, have you seen Matthew Wolf? That guy really never stops talking. Okay. Um, oh, Kevin Kistner. Surprisingly, I actually am quite high on him. Um, I, I make him 113 to one, which I consider quite high relative to the market right now. Um, if we go down to the sort of bottom, um, like Lucas Glover, I make 265 to one. There's like three hundreds out there available on him. Rory Sabatini, who I seem to like every week, I make him 193 to one. There's 300 to ones on him. Um, and another guy I seem to like all the time, Sebastian Munoz looks like there are 200 somethings out there. Um, and I make him 184 to one. So, oh, and one more, I guess. I'll give a European out. Um, Shane Lowry. Um, I make him 164 to one and there are some 200s out there and higher. Nice. Uh, any, any interesting fades guys that you think are high that, that you think will bomb? Like, is this not a good course for Bryson to try to like do his 700 yard drives? 
I'm anti Adam Scott for some reason. And I don't actually know why. I mean, I make him 179 to one. I make Carlos Ortiz slightly more likely to win. Um, I normally, I mean, he's a guy that you wouldn't say is a bad fit. It might just be recent recency. I haven't actually dug into it. How about you, Matthew? Any, any, any uh, fades? I mean, I don't think we've ever been as far off market as we are, as we are with speed, like on anybody uh, as we are with speed right now, which, I don't feel great about, and that's being driven mostly by the market is really uh, piling on to his 2021 form a lot. Plus, we have Speed has a bad fit here, and he has a bad history. Um, so we're like really like we have him at. I mean, this is why the bookmaker probably wouldn't want to use our odds because we have we have Speed at uh, 228 to one or seven to one. I usually deal with probabilities, but. Yeah, 227 European odds, and the market's at 31. <laughs> but that's not a true, I mean, that's a one way, one sided uh, market. You can't I, bet I against know. speed there. That's, I mean, I okay, make that's... speed like 110 to one. Can't and I think I'm, speed and I'm high. Puppy. But I actually show value yeah. on speed on some matchups, which kind of like bothers me a little bit. Like, I well, don't, yeah. To the degree, to the, to the degree that we're influencing uh, matchup markets, I think. That makes sense. I mean, we are low on even, I agree, obviously your point about it being a one-way market is relevant, but yeah, the even in matchups, we're pretty low on speed. So I'm a bit worried about it because I actually do think he's back, so. That was a question I was gonna ask and forgot to ask it about speed and how, I mean, limitations of prediction essentially and, and how you, a guy that was elite and sort of fell down and became a mediocre golfer and then a mediocre professional golfer and, and starts to get it back. Like, are you, you know, how it, it's a hard thing to, it's a hard thing to know how to model. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think it's always bothered me that super long-term data is not really in our model. Like the fact that Steve played really well from 2015 to 2017 is not really affecting our predictions for him right now, which is seems stupid, but it's hard to, I mean, this is why it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's useful when you can make a lot of manual tweaks and stuff, because I think there are things for speed that I would do that probably wouldn't be good for everybody else, but uh, might be something that would work with speed. But yeah, it's tricky for sure. Why this is so hard. All right. I think that's a wrap, guys. Thanks so yeah. much for joining us, Matthew. Uh, Rufus, thanks for joining us also. Um, I don't even know where you are. It's wonderful wallpaper, though. Oh, it's... It's a place called We Work. All right. We'll see you guys in uh, a couple weeks or next week, depending on how motivated we are. Good luck in the players, people. On this week's Bet the Process podcast, we talk a lot of golf with the founder of Data Golf, which is doing cutting edge work in the world of analytics and golf. And we have the preeminent golf better in the world, my partner, Rufus Peabody, on actually giving negative EV picks as always. So with that, let's start the process.